Take your Bible and turn again, this time to Acts chapter 13, verses 13 through 38. It is page 929 in the Pew Bible. The white sheet outline, farewell to Ephesus, Acts 20, 13 to 38. Paul defends his record. Paul charges the elders. Paul blesses the elders and some applications. Let's hear God's word again, beginning in verse 13 of chapter 20 of Acts 2. This is the end of the chapter. Yeah. Hear God's word. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, he took, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day uh, opposite Chios, and the next day we touched at Samos, and the day after that we went on to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus, so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him, and when they came to him he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility with tears, with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of the repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, only that I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom of God will see my face again. Therefore, I testify you to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak. Remember the words of Jesus, the Lord Jesus, how he said himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, we knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. 
This is the Lord's word for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the commendation of your grace and your word to us. Open our hearts not only to see and to hear what has happened, but to know what things still happen and how we are to live, how we are to be encouraged and exhorted through Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a very emotional passage. It has a tearful goodbye and it's made poignant, more poignant by the statement that he says and they echo that they would not see his face again. It's a final farewell. He had spent three years in Ephesus. Paul's length of ministry on this earth is not that long when you think of it. Three years is a lot. We get a lot more time in ministry, perhaps. And, okay, Paul's ministry does continue through the things that he has written. For example, that letter to the church at Ephesus. God still uses, through his letters, Paul. But there is something about face-to-face. I mentioned last week when we had uh, Eutychus and how he made sure he didn't want to go home because this was the Apostle Paul who was preaching and it went late into the night and he fell asleep. and Well, he died and the Lord brought him back to, to life. But that, that desire to see the Apostle Paul, now they're finding out that he was not going to be with them again. Now, aside from the touching farewell, there's a few things that we can really learn here focus on the thing that Paul was focused on. He wanted to make his life count, and he was laser-focused on the gospel and the word of God. He was there, as long as he was here to serve, he was going to be preaching the word of God. He was going to be teaching. He was going to be listening. He was going to be encouraging people. Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus in a way that was very dramatic. And I don't know anybody else who even claims to have that dramatic of a conversion experience. But we're all called to live for the Lord as long as we're here. That's important. All of our lives, we have a career. We still do that as a Christian. We retire. We do that as a Christian. We interact with families as the Lord would have us do. It's it's important. We live our lives focused. And it's true, too, that our own type of service is not always of our own choosing. We don't have the energy. We don't have the ability. We don't have the opportunity. But sometimes we have this one, and sometimes we have that one. Whatever it is, we're to be focused on the things of the Lord that he'd have us do. From the charge that Paul gives, we learn what is important to lead the people of God. We're not all ordained to lead in the church, but we're all in the church and should know what those who are ordained should be doing. And he does talk about this. And he talks about this in, but Paul talks about this and the Lord directs us through some of the letters of Paul. Pay attention to these things. That's what he says to these elders. And it's interesting, he just called the elders, but there's a reason for that. Lastly, we see the prospering of the church is not just a factor of the faithfulness of the people. It's not just how well the elders eld. I heard once somebody say, uh, deacons, deek. I thought that was funny. Well, no, they, they, they serve. The elders lead. They shepherd, oversee even, pray for. That's a very important part But it's not just how well they're able to do that. It's the blessing of God that does that. Because we were called to lead, know that we lead the best that we can, and that God's the one who really brings the increase. Even Paul says that. You know, I planted, Apollos watered. God brings the increase, the blessing of God. James writes that faith without works is dead. That means it's not real faith. It's not a living faith through God which good things happen, a real faith that connects us to Jesus. 
Now, your faith is not just ideas in your head, it's in your heart and it motivates you. Let's look at the description of these travels again, beginning in verse 13. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul on board there, for so he arranged, intending to go by himself by land. He met us at Assos, we took him on board. Again, the we there. Luke is part of this, he's seeing this. And uh, from there we went to uh, Mytilene, and sailing from there, opposite the day opposite Chios, that, that it's one of the islands, they, they sailed by that one, and then they just touched at, at Samos, and after that they came to Miletus, and this is the place where all this is going to be happening. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. This is all coming down in what's northern, well, it's Asia Minor, but it's northern Turkey there, so they're coming along the coast. Paul had spent three years in Ephesus. He knows if he shows up there, they're not going to be able to let him go, and he's not going to want to go. And he's, he, really, he really wanted to go to Jerusalem. In fact, early, he says, I, I think I want to go in time for Passover. And he, but since I'm right here, I think I'll go over into Asia, I'm sorry, from Asia, over into Greece, and I'm going to look through there, and then he spends time, and because of a plot, he doesn't sail down to Jerusalem. He reverses and comes back the other way, and so he meant to leave weeks ago for Jerusalem, and now he's back near Ephesus. It's just the way things happen. We make our plans, God directs our steps, and this is all part of God's plan here. He knew he couldn't get away, but he wanted to say goodbye to the elders. And so he goes to this city that's just a little south of Ephesus, and he calls for them to come there. The first thing he does is he defends his record. Now, how long was he with the elders when they came down? It doesn't say, but probably not long at all, you know, when he was at uh, Troas, he, he preached and was preaching them all through the night, even until the morning. He was preaching right up to the time the boat's leaving. They say, let's go now. He says, oh, okay, I have to go now. I think he really wanted to give them this final charge and then leave. He's not lingering here. They know the things of God. They knew their calling. He wanted to give them one last encouragement because he wasn't coming back. And the leadership of that church is going to be through these elders. Verse 17, if you look. From now, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, called the elders of the church to come. And when they came to him, he said, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord in all humility and with tears and with trials happening to me through the plots of the Jews. His life had not been easy. It wasn't easy there in Ephesus. There was a constant friction between those who were in the synagogue who did not receive Jesus and those who left the synagogue to be part of the people of, of, of Jesus, the people of God in Christ. And then there were Gentiles coming in as well. But there was that continual friction. And you might also remember, not long before here, the silversmiths who were selling all their idols to, the, to the, their goddess, their patron uh, goddess, the sales went way down. You know why sales are down? Says Paul, he's, they're not worshiping here anymore. They don't believe in this stuff anymore. And so there was a riot. There was a lot of things that Paul went through. But Paul didn't let the opposition, the threats, even the riots, deter him from preaching about Jesus. Why? Because he had seen Jesus. Jesus stopped him and turned his life a complete 180 I mean, talk about spinning on a dime. He's against Jesus, against Jesus, against Jesus. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. He's for Jesus, he's for Jesus, he's for Jesus. That's, that's the bend of his life. He doesn't, he doesn't slow down. He just completely reverses. In fact, he probably has even more. He does have more power now. Verse 20, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. This is his record of ministry. This is what I was among you for three years. They, they rented that one hall, and every day he was teaching there as people would gather. He also went from house to house 
to listen, to hear, to answer questions, to encourage individually. And one of the reasons he's saying this is he's reminding them. And by the way, he says, I'm not coming back. This is, this is the final thing. Uh, this is the way it happened. This is how I remember it, right? And they say, well, yeah, they had an opportunity. Verse 21, testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's re- preaching to all who listen. Here's the message. Repent, believe in Jesus. Repent, believe in Jesus. He never lets off that. He just explains more and more what that is. And so what's the center of our message? Repent and believe in Jesus. What if I already repented? That's wonderful. And what if I'm already believing in Jesus? Praise the Lord. So I would tell you, repent and believe in Jesus. Because there's things we keep repenting of. The Lord shows us new things. And we're able, again, to to trust in the Lord. Deeper, our faith deepens. We who trust, we who are in Christ, that's our role as well. I love this, too. He says, I didn't shrink from anything telling you anything that was profitable. I told you what you needed. Later down, he's, he's going to use a, a, a phrase that we use a, a lot about the whole counsel of God. Uh, verse 22, Now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has tied me to this. Not knowing what will happen to me, Exactly, not knowing exactly, but he does know because the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await. There's two things. He's heading for for Jerusalem because he feels this is where the Holy Spirit would have him go. But the Holy Spirit is also telling him directly and him through other people, and it goes even stronger later on that this is going to be a place where there's going to be imprisonment, there's going to be trial, it's going to be very difficult. And the important thing I think we see here is how Paul deals with this conflict. He's giving himself to Christ, he says, whatever the Lord has for me, I will do. Verse 24, I do not count my life of any value or precious to myself, only that I might finish the ministry that I've received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the grace of the of gospel of grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Wow. Finishing the line, finishing the crossing the finish line. We get this again, don't we? In all of us, the differences we have, the thing that we have in common is our faith in Christ and that we want to live our life here all the way to glory. Now, Paul had a particular calling. He was an apostle that Jesus tapped and said, no, don't do that. You're going to be my herald. And that is a calling that's pretty unique to him, the way that happened. But we're all called, all of our circumstances, different as they are, we're called to be faithful in them. second point is Paul charges the elders. Why is he talking about how faithful he's been? Because he wants them to be faithful too. It's an example. This is how I've done it. I've modeled this. This is important. And he's turning over to them the the charge of leading this church in this great city. It was the principal city of the region. It was growing. They needed to be faithful. Verse 26 Therefore, I testify you to this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. By that, he means that he gave the word and didn't shrink back. In the Old Testament, it talks about the the prophet who is the watchman on the wall. And the watchman is supposed to call out the danger. If the danger comes and the watchman doesn't call out, that's the watchman's fault. The prophet of God the minister of God, the elder, is supposed to be calling out all things, not just the popular things, but all things, the whole counsel of God. I am innocent of the blood of all. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. 
That phrase, the whole counsel of God, is in the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is in the back of the hymn book. It's one we kind of like, the place where I went to seminary. That's the, that's the motto, the whole counsel of God. Presbyterians, we like to emphasize that. You know, every word of God proves true. It says in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5, every word of God is flawless. Blessed is the man who puts his trust in them. The whole counsel of God. And he says, every word proves true here, and he, he tells them to pay careful attention to yourself. This is in verse 28. By the way, this is what Paul tells Timothy in his letter to him. Pay attention to yourself. Pay attention to your own faith. Pay attention to the way that you live because if you do, you'll be with Christ. You'll be saving not just yourself, but others who are counting on you. Now, we're not all elders, but we all have areas of responsibility and influence. People look at you. They look to you. You have the opportunity. Look to yourself because you are the one with God, and you are the one who needs to be reminded where you need repentance. You are the one that needs to be reminded how you can have greater faith. But there's also people looking to you to see how it's done. I have heard people say, and I fully understand, and I'm sure I've said it myself, you know, don't look at me, I'm not perfect. Look at Jesus, Jesus is perfect. But the truth is people look at you and they have a right to look at you because while they might, if they think you ought to be perfect, there's something wrong in their thinking, I think. But you are to be showing something real. Is the faith real? It should be real in your life. If it's real in your life, they think maybe it could be real in mine. Not to be perfect, to be faithful. Pay attention to yourself. Pay attention to yourselves, verse 28, and all the flock to which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he or obtained by his own blood. It is true when the leadership works well together with the Lord, there's greater flourishing. It's not just the opposite of the sin in the flesh that comes, though. There's the opposition of leaders that happens. Uh, things come into the church which are not right, theologically not right, practices not right, and they're harmful. And Paul warns them, don't let that happen. Part of your job as leaders is to watch over and to encourage the flock, to warn them when they need warned, to comfort them when they need comforted, to encourage them always, to know the word, to live for Jesus, to rejoice in Christ, but also to protect them from those who are going to teach things that are going to be harmful. Verse 29, I know after my departure, fierce wolves, fierce wolves, will come in among you, not sparing the flock. They'll have force behind them. They'll gather a flock to themselves. They're going to be concerned with their own brand. They're going to be concerned with their ways, their distinctives, rather than be aware and concerned about the welfare of the people of God and the things about Christ. It's going to be about their own agenda. They may quote the Bible, but that doesn't mean that they're teaching it right. I need not remind you that Satan quoted the Bible and Jesus said, no, nah, you don't have that right. And not in those words, but that's essentially what he said when he was being tempted. Where do the wolves come from? Well, they come from the outside, but also from within the church. He says in verse 30, from among your own selves. Now, that might not be one of these people. It's not like Jesus at the Last Supper said, one of you will betray me. Uh, but those who come into the church and maybe even rise in the church, they may become some of these wolves. You need to be watching after one another. Those from the outside, those from the inside. One of the things that we do at Presbytery is we examine candidates for ministry. We want to make sure that they know what they know and believe what they believe that they have the gifts that are given there. 
But you know, one of the things that we're better at is seeing how their theology is and how well they answer questions. The thing we don't have as much opportunity is what is their character? And one of the things that when a, a man wants to be a minister, the church, the session of the church, the elders of the church will send a letter of, yes, we think this person has the gifts and the character because we don't necessarily see them that well to be able to do that. And that's important because I've seen men come into ministry who are able to answer questions and they're very bright and gifted, but they don't, they look more like wolves and it brings destruction. Their character comes to dominate, not to love. One of the things about uh, being a minister is my own people treat me with real love. And sometimes people in the, in the general population will because they look at a minister and they think, oh, he's connected to Jesus. I love Jesus. I'm going to do something to express that. And I often say, you know, that's really nice because I realize there's nothing I've done here, but that's the way they are, and I'm going to receive it for Jesus. That's a good thing, by the way. I hear of people say, I just love the way my, my preacher preaches. And it makes my heart sing, because there they're used to hearing the word of God, and the word of God is getting to them. And as a minister, and I see people's lives change uh, with the word of God, I get really excited. And when I started preaching, I thought, wow, I must be a really great preacher. <laughs> just because God was using it. And this may sound odd. I know I'm a better preacher than I was then, but I don't know that I'm that good of a preacher. God uses it. That's what makes the key. And there should be that love. So for ministers, all ministers, I would say, remember on Palm Sunday when the crowd was saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. They were saying that to Jesus, not the donkey he was riding on. I'm the donkey. But the donkey also got to hear it all and see it all. And that's pretty exciting. Be alert. Remember that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. I've been training y'all. That's what he said. Be ready. The third point, he blesses the elders. He gives his, his example. He gives his account as an example and he also charges them. It's important to, to let them know and remind them what they're supposed to do, but it doesn't stop there. Christian life is service, but like that other old hymn says, all is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. It is the blessing of God that makes it happen. It is the blessing of God that changes lives. What's the crucial factor in any church of Jesus? It's the spirit of Jesus. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. This isn't that we've got good ideas or we're, we're talented or whatever. It is the presence of God that ministers. And when you felt the presence of God ministering, you felt something real. Every sermon you've ever heard where you said, wow, the Lord spoke to me there, well, that was the voice of God. Praise the Lord for that. Paul had done all he could do. He, he commends them. He says, now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Will this church continue? Will this church, this great church in Ephesus, grow? And the answer is yes. Yes, it will. Paul did what he could, the elders will do what they can, but God himself will be there and his presence is there as long as there's an Ephesus. By the way, there's not an Ephesus anymore. Things changed. The gospel went other places and so did everybody else. If you want to find Ephesus, they're, they're digging it up out of the ground, the ruins. But God's presence was there with his people and continues with his people. And his word, it says, commend to you God and the word of his grace. How do we know what's right? It's the word of God. How do we know that we're not lured into something false? We see what God has said. 
What do we need to build us up for life here and for our life eternal? It's the word of God. I'm preaching through the book of Acts. Isn't it fun? I think it is. But the reason that we're preaching the word of God and the whole counsel of God is because this is what keeps us where we need to be. We're tethered. The Holy Spirit uses the word of God to convict us, to convert us, to encourage us. Praise the Lord. Paul does continue to defend his record, not to toot his own horn, but to give an example. He's leaving. He's not coming back. Leaders don't go on forever. We had the Old Testament passage that most of you know. Some of you have it printed in your house somewhere. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I've got that printed up so I can see it. It's not a bad thing to see. But you've got to understand what Joshua was saying when he said that. He came to the end of his time and he said, it's time for me to be going on, to be with the Lord. It's time for me to be done here. And we've gone through all these things and I'm not going to be here anymore. He says, I don't want a gold watch. I want to know that this is going to continue. You need to choose indeed who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve the Lord? Or are you going to serve the gods that are in the land? It's for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And then he starts to look at the others. What about you and your house? 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 Right? And they all did, family by family. We will serve the Lord. He says, now don't just say that. You know the Lord's not going to be happy if you say you're going to serve the Lord, but you don't. No, he's the one who brought us up. He's the one who we will serve. He's doing the same thing here. Samuel, when, when he was uh, no longer going to lead the people, but Saul became king, he said, you know, is, is there, uh, I want you to witness here, you know, I've not been stealing from you or doing anything bad. Uh, Paul said the same thing here, I coveted no one's silver or gold. You know, selves know how these hands administer to my necessities and those with him. He's, he's showing this not just for the leaders, but for all, because it's important to be kind to the poor. Verse 31, I have, in all things, I've shown you that by working hard, we may help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, it's more blessed to give than to receive. We do this in physical ways. We do this in all ways. It's part of the thing that ties us together. And then the thing that does tie together is worship. And this is how he ends, verse 36. When he said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. And they embraced Paul and they kissed him, being sorrowful, most of all because of the word which he had spoken. That they never see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Now the applications here I hope are pretty obvious. I've used an old sermon device where you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. So basically, what, what have I had? First, purpose to live your life for Christ. That's what Paul was saying about himself, about these elders, and about all things. Are you trusting in Christ? Purpose to live that way. Live faithfully in a way that flows from the heart. Be looking at yourself often. Pay attention to yourself, as he said. See where the Lord is moving in, in you. Second, leadership in the church is important. Those called into service, pray for your elders and your deacons. Pray for those in non-ordained areas that serve as well. Pray for yourself in the areas of influence that you have with people you're with, that no corrupt word would come out of your mouth, but only for meeting the needs of others according to what they need to bless others. This is what we're called to. And then finally, realize it's not just up to you, 
It's not up to you to hold back the tide. You can't hold back the tide. It's up to you to trust God and receive his blessing and continually ask for it. God blesses. God empowers. God is here. You grow in grace. There are things you can do to grow in grace. Gather for worship. Spend time in the word. Time in prayer. Focus on the Lord. There are things that will cause you to grow in grace, but it's God's grace that causes you to grow. Let's grow in Christ together. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the example given, even as we can see it. You know our hearts. You know the things that we need. We ask that you would lead us, that you would guide us. Oh, Lord, that you would make us each aware of your presence and to encourage one another in the good things that we see and in trusting you. Lord, you've heard our prayers, our concerns. You've heard our praises. Be glorified in us. Thank you, too, for this congregation. Again, by your faithfulness, been here 50 years. Lord, I, I ask that you would continue to be pleased to use us here to gather your people, to share your gospel, and in all things, empower us by your spirit. Thank you for the promise that you would never leave us or forsake us. Draw us, we pray.